Politicians also need money, and those one-issue voters are more likely to give it to you. Special interest groups support one candidate because of one position. So the sugar producers are going to give money to politicians who are in favor of keeping the sugar restrictions on. In the last election, we saw evangelicals vote for one particular candidate because that candidate is pro-life. They wanted certain to be certain that Supreme Court justices that got nominated by that candidate would be pro-life Supreme Court justices. So you have these groups of one-issue voters. It's rational behavior in the sense that it's a low-cost way to make the decision. There's no downside to those folks. They don't lose anything if their candidate doesn't win necessarily, but they stand to gain a lot if their candidate wins relative to. So they get potentially high benefits at a low cost by being a one-issue voter. So how do we best vote for things? How do we best vote for things? How do we make sure that no one's hurt by a policy or a politician? Well, the clean answer to that is what we would call the unanimity rule, in which 100% is required to win. Everybody in the Senate has to go along, and everybody in the House has to go along. All voters have to vote for the same person to be president. What? Well, it's not going to work, right? We're never going to have everybody agree. And even if you had something that almost everybody agreed on, you could have one person hold out, and when that one person holds out, the others are all going to have to do something to move that one person. So very small minorities of one can mess up the process for everybody across the whole country. We're not going to do unanimity because unanimity as a voting mechanism is just never going to work. Imagine that whatever group you're a part of, you have to get everybody to buy in to do it. But, yeah, hopefully you see that. What about two-thirds? Well, two-thirds majority, we do it on some things. As we'll see, for example, in Nevada, a tax increase takes a two-thirds majority in the state legislature. But again, two-thirds majorities mean that two sides are going to have to get together. We never have a two-thirds majority in the House or the Senate for one party, which means you're always going to have a fight between the two parties, and you're always going to have to get some folks from party B to vote with party A, and it's not going to be functional most of the time happens, but it's not going to be functional most of the time. So we settle on the 50% plus one rule. We settle on what's called a simple majority. And the problem with the simple majority is it allows that 50% plus one to do bad things to the 49%. So the question in our voting model, in the 50% voting model, is how do we protect the minority groups? How do we protect the groups in society that are 10% or 20% or 30% of the population because everybody else could vote to mess with them, right? We could, we could pass a law that says everybody over 6'5 has to pay 90% income tax <laughs> and then give it to us who are shorter than that, okay? How do we protect the minority from exploitation by the majority? Good question. The Founding Fathers were worried about tyranny. They were worried about essentially a king doing bad things. We've talked about this. Read your Declaration of Independence again, and there's a whole long list of things that the King of England did to the United States that 
were done without any input, no taxation, without representation. And again, the, the story about the Boston Tea Party isn't really a good story because they didn't raise the taxes on tea. There was other stuff going on, but they're worried about tyranny. They're worried about an individual coming to power and doing things by themselves that deprive someone of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. They don't want a single person in the United States to be able to do bad things. Number two, they're worried about the 13 colonies having to agree on something. And if everything has to be unanimous, and if you read the Articles of Confederation, you'll see that some things that the federal government would do under the Articles of Confederation had to be agreed to by either 9 or 13 of the colonies, which is a lot. And you have the upside-down problem that the little, when you're voting by colony, the little guys can gang up on the big guys. We have this issue in the U.S. Senate that it's possible, it's not likely, because they're in different parties, but it's possible there are, if we rank the senators by population of their state, those 52 senators at the bottom represent 18% of the population. So it's possible for 18, these 52 senators who represent 18% of the population of the United States to make decisions for the whole country. So you can have the small states telling the big states what to do. We don't really see that again. We don't really see that in the Senate. But it's possible. For example, the small states could all gang up and push a Supreme Court nominee through that the big states were against, and the 18% could vote yes, and the 82% could vote no, and yet that person could get put into their spot. The Founding Fathers were also worried about states losing their autonomy. They wanted states to still have power and individuality as states. So what was their answer? Well, their answers are simple. One is to have a large Congress. The more people you have in Congress, the harder it is for any person or small group of people to mess with things. So when they started, you were going to have 26 senators. And after that first census got done, you would have had about 100 people in the House of Representatives. So 26 senators, 100 people in the House. If you really want to screw with people, you've got to get 51 in the House and 14 in the Senate, and then you still got to... The having a lot of people minimizes the chance that a small group of people can do something mean or bad. And they split the Senate up into two houses. So we have the Senate and the House. They're selected differently. Right? The House of Representatives is a popular vote. The people of the United States directly were picking the people in the House of Representatives, and the Founding Fathers at least argued that Americans are smart enough not to pick dumb people to go into the House to represent them. The Constitution has severe limits on presidential authority. The president has almost no powers. Everything they do is subject to the advice and consent of the Senate, or is done because the House and the Senate passed a bill that comes to them. The president's primary authority is to veto things, to tell, say no, but the president doesn't have the power to raise money, spend money, none of that. So there's a lot of limits on that president to try to make sure they don't overreach and become a tyrant. And in the original Constitution, remember that the state senates picked the president and the senators. So your state legislature picks the president and picks the senators. And the founding fathers believed that state legislatures somehow were smart and they would always pick good people to be president or senator. So again, the Constitution is full of protections to try to protect Americans from abuse by the federal government.